Bigger warning for today's episode. Today's episode contains content of child sexual abuse, suicide, and whether or not you've been affected by these issues, it is a very raw conversation, which some people may find hard to listen to. If you've been affected by any of the topics on this episode, I will be linking links to helplines and websites where you can find more information in the bottom in the description. So if you're on YouTube, click on the comment section. It's all down there. If you're on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, just click down there. All the links are going to be there. Uh, if you're going to be triggered at all during this episode, please watch another episode. You think that everyone kind of knew, because again, it's your kids. You don't really understand what's going on. Do you think you kind of used banter as a collective way to deal with this thing that's going on or, or literally completely oblivious to it? Oblivious to it. One of the, 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 the kids there, when I went back and I first reported in, I walked into the police station. Um, one of the paedophile officers, detectives, was one of the players who was in the older group of players. Welcome to the Prime Life Project podcast, a place to help you unlock your full potential, both mentally and physically, to become the best version of you. Welcome back to another episode of the Primal Project Podcast, a place to help you both mentally and physically become the best version of yourself. Uh, if you have not listened to the uh, trigger warning for today's episode, please stop the episode right now, go back to the start and just listen to the trigger warning. Um, if you're still with us, then uh, welcome to today's episode. Uh, I'm your host, Daniel James. Uh, I've got a very powerful episode, a very raw episode for you today. Um, I'm actually today with a good friend of mine uh, who I'm going to introduce in a minute and we've got a really powerful story to share with you and this is someone I've known for uh, about 12 years we've kind of figured it out and he's originally uh, the person that helped me um, from a footballing point of view and got me in with a professional team a long long time ago uh, and then as of uh, late we've reconnected um, and I've basically been returning the favour with him and this whole thing today is for him to basically help people that have gone through the same thing that he has gone through. And I'm going to let him intro himself in a second, but my, my guest today is Mr. Dave Norton, who's played top flight football for Aston Villa in the 1980s. He's had spells at Notts County, Hull City, Northampton Town, Hereford United and Cheltenham Town. So Dave, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Um, so what are we talking about today and why now? Um, well, obviously it's a very delicate subject um, for me. And I've had many opportunities to talk about it in the past, but I haven't been in the right place mentally or emotionally to be, I suppose, strong enough to, to talk about it. Um, I'd like to talk about, you know, when I was abused sexually um, as a young 11 year old uh, by an Aston Villa scout. Um, there's a few reasons why uh, I want to talk about it now. Mainly, I think the the biggest thing is is it's for me. Um, I think when you, we all have our issues and our problems and our stresses and and whatever. But uh, recently, I've just gone through another tough period, and when I go through tough periods, it kind of hits me hard. But I also have something inside me that wants to learn about myself. Um, and the reasons why I feel like I do. Uh, and thankfully, we, we came together again. I think I reached out um, maybe a year or whatever ago, and we never got together. Um, and I saw something on, I think it was Instagram or Facebook, and I thought, you know what, it's time to reach out. And we had a chat, and I think there's, there's a type of person that you can talk about all this to, and that person has to understand and that's what came across and you know I discovered some things with with yourself that um, has enabled me to put things in place so it's about me <coughs> accepting what happened accepting the way I am and the way I struggle and what my role is in that really being accountable another reason is um, you know in 2016 uh, the child abuse scandal really at the headlines and I was asked by various um, media outlets including you know Victoria Derbyshire and BBC and ITN and people like that um, for the chance to put my side to the story and I also did a, 
uh, an interview with the Daily Mail, uh, which on my say-so could have been published, but I was never in that place where I could actually talk about it. Um, and I kind of feel as though I let, the down, let down the the guys who did come out, you know, Tony O'Brien, who's a very good friend of mine, who I spoke to on a number of occasions, um, Andy Woodward, who, who came out with it in the first place. Uh, but I just couldn't, I couldn't do it. I was living in fear, really. Mm. And that's one of the biggest things, I think, when you said about reaching out originally, because we had this conversation, didn't we, when we first had that walk, and we basically said that it wasn't the right time. Because I said, I think it's a case of, I said, yeah, yeah, let me know when you're ready. And you just never got back to me because it wasn't quite the right time. But then something compelled you to reach out this time. And then from there, there's a lot of things that have sort of connected for you. And now it's the right time for just like, well, actually, the lot of stuff has connected for me. Now is the time to actually just share my side of the story. So it's coming from the right place rather than potentially before. It's for, you've always been forced to do it by external factors. Now you're sort of doing it because you want to do it. Yeah, it, it it is, you know, I've given two reasons there. And then the third reason is like, really, I mean, I have to say that this is for me. First and foremost, it's for me to confront those fears, face the fears, um, accept what they are. And I suppose, you know, kind, finally like laying to ghost, you know, the fact that <clears throat> I've got nothing to be ashamed or guilty about. Um, and from that, the third reason, obviously, is if anybody can take something good from this, um, some strength, not necessarily to come come out with it publicly or to family members or anything like that, because that's everybody's choice. I know how difficult that is. Uh, but to just face it in their own in their own mind. Mm -hmm. um, because that's one of the things that you don't, you you just kind of, it almost just becomes a um, a word and a memory. You don't dive into your thoughts. You know, you don't want to accept any of the, your present uh, feelings, emotions have got anything to do with it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think sometimes like just accepting that in the first place will take you to, to the next step in in recovering because it's not something that you ever forget. It's not something that will ever go, but um, it's something that I think you can learn to to manage mm -hmm. and put in its in its place. Yeah. Um, I think something which I'm sure we'll go on to soon um, that we discussed, uh, I think um, the first time we, we had that, that walk, um, the emotions that you you go through at certain stages of your life if there's been a you know a heavy trauma to yourself those emotions stick um and it's time for me to say goodbye mm -hmm. it's a big thing we, we sort of got that about the again we will dive into this in a second because basically for the listener uh, i know dave's story i've been we've met multiple times now, haven't we and um i said we've, we've gone over this a lot of times i understand dave's story and what dave wants to get out of this so i'm basically guiding the questions for dave to sort of share everything and really sort of deep dive into this again for dave and also for for, for, for the listeners here but i think one of the biggest things that we spoke about that basically kind of alluded to there was the fact that a lot of this stuff that happened in your childhood the patterns had then almost repeated themselves as an adult and you hadn't put the dots necessarily together then once you understand that it kind of all clicks and makes sense and then you can do something with that information yeah it has i mean like you know we spoke about um i think obviously being a professional footballer um you have to have something inside you you have to have, you have to have some steel inside you because there's so many um positive but more negative experiences that you can have and you have to learn to deal with stuff um, so I've always, always regarded myself as quite strong and if I had to stand up for my principles or, you know, individuals at football clubs I've played for that I, was, I thought was being hard done to, I've always stood up for that. But I think like, you know, from um, an emotional point of view, uh, as much as I am strong in other areas, I haven't had that strength and um, I haven't been able to deal with things. Mm -hmm. Um, and I've, I've admitted that for quite a while really but it, in once 
in one way it's okay admitting it the next thing you have to do is like um take action to to deal with it mm -hmm. um and that's okay but it's like <laughs> the situations i found myself in i haven't been able to to do that so um you end up in a very dark place mm -hmm. so let's go back to the beginning because this is kind of yeah because it's important when we do this i do this with a lot of my guests but it's really important in this part of the story because the beginning and how it all started your your home life when you're younger that kind of paints the pathway for what happened so can you just take myself and my audience back to sort of what life was like for you growing up um, because there's a massive feeling here that we've spoken about multiple times like you're not feeling wanted uh, there's a lot of stuff going on with your family so can you sort of take my audience back there to what life was like for you growing up before aston miller uh well um i come from a uh, mom and dad were divorced as is you know there's lots of, of kids like that now dad works away a lot um i've got a very very good memory um i can remember so much detail in so many things because obviously i, I feel as i've been through a lot so you tend the more you feel the more you remember and I think before the age of three, three and a half, um, I don't really, I can only remember two, three occasions of being with my dad, yet I can remember lots of other occasions. Simple occasions like, um, you know, my mum was, uh, did some hairdressing and she had like some silver scissors and a comb. Um, I can remember cutting all the kids' hairs in the garage and charging them a penny. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. yeah, and, and like their parents come round one one at a time, knocking on the door. And I can remember being under the the table, scared as anything. Um, you know, and, and I can remember all those kind of things. And with my dad being around, I can't remember it. Um, and then all of a sudden, like you know, we we moved from the family home and went to live with my uh, my grandparents. And that was me, my mom, and my, my brother, my brother Trace. And uh, we lived there for a while. Then we got a flat just down the road. <clears throat> I can remember uh, moving a single bed from, from my grand and from my nans and down to the flat. So we all sat on the bed and pushed it down the, the road. That's how I used to move things in those days. And we were happy as anything. Um, me, my mom, my brother, we had, my dad was quite reasonably well off. Um, but we weren't. I can always like, you know, remember, I don't know, a stew was a treat, mm. you know, egg, beans and chips was a treat. Beans on toast was a regular. Um, you struggled, you know, buying a, a pint of sterilized milk in the mornings. Um, but we were happy. You know, we used to put the 50 pence in the, the TV and turn it so you could watch the TV. Sure, and raise you a bit now, Dave. I know, yeah. Um, we also discovered how to take the back off of it. A long <laughs> way back, so we could keep putting the same 50 pence in. Um, and they were really, really great, happy times. You know, I love my brother. We were as close as anything. And then um, my mum uh, met two people. One was um, Keith. Their relationship didn't last, but they were friends for life. And he was like my second dad who I, I lost at Christmas. Um, he was a great man. I was, uh, you know looked out for me with, with everything um, and after that relationship ended uh, my mum met uh, my stepfather and whatever the relationship between them and, and all of this you know I've got two wonderful um, sisters from that uh, but my mum suffered we suffered he was not the <clears throat> well my mum suffered abuse basically and for our own safety we moved back up to my hands um, when I was about seven, I think it was. Um, and my mum went through an awful lot, you know, for many years I didn't, until you go into your own relationships and discover, you know, what relationships are all about, you don't really understand, you know, what my mum went through. And perhaps for years, you know, I didn't understand it and resented it a little bit and stuff, I don't know. Um, but we went up to live with, with Manan and for, for a while that was great. And then I started to get, um, I wanted to live with my dad and I didn't see my dad enough. You know, he, he would, um, 
we'd see him every couple of weeks. We'd either go over to the house, brand new house, brand new car and everything. Um, always sitting at the table for meals, something totally alien to us. Um, or or he, he would come over and work on his, his, his other car in the garage and we'd see, we'd play football outside while he, he was there, but he'd let us down quite a bit. Mm-hmm. When you were your grandma's, was this just you and your brother, or was your mum there with your grandma as well? Uh, no, just me and my brother. So, 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 so cause this is a key part of the story here. So, so, so um, the stuff your mum's going through, you and your brother moved. So you're now living with your grandma, yeah. just you and your brother, and then you want to see your dad. I just wanted because it's a key part of the story here about that that moving around a lot. So I just want to sort of paint that story there. So it's key details missing there. You might have to do that. No, no, you are. No, no, no. So I just want to clarify. I've heard your story multiple times. I just want to make sure because that's a key part where, where we're building into this about the, the feelings, the sort of how, how, the whole thing about not not feeling wanted. So part of that was actually the fact of your mum had, obviously at the time you didn't understand it. It was for your own protection, but for you right there as a child, you're going to feel unwanted. You're going to feel unloved. You're there with your grandparents, and then you have got this dad who you kind of idolise, but then he doesn't really want to see you as much. He lets you down quite a bit. And that's when that sort of feeling of not feeling good enough, not feeling loved kind of started to seep in a bit. Yeah. I mean, he, you know, I, I, I got to the stage where I wanted to go and live with my dad. I needed my dad. And he said, yeah, you can come and live over here. We'd ju- he'd just gone into the pub trade. Um, and he'd say like, okay, so October half term, you can come and live with us. Christmas, you can come and live with us. February, you can come and live with us. And he kept changing his mind. I can remember sitting on the stairs while he was arguing with my nan and granddad. Uh, downstairs and then he came up the stairs if you don't stop crying uh, I'll put you in a um, uh, an orphanage not an orphanage um, a boarding home a boarding home and uh, I can remember looking out the window and waiting for my dad to come you know in the bedroom never really saw so I, I got this over that period I got this feeling of like you know my dad didn't want me to stay and in the end he relented and like you know I went to live with him um, and he was in the pub trade, so obviously didn't have much time for us. So that feeling grew. And we moved from one pub to a really, um, a brand new pub, which was really popular with um, people from Crossroads and Coronation Street and whatever. And people who had a bit of money and, and like, you know, um, still didn't see a lot of him. Uh, still playing football, missed my brother massively, even more so because I only saw him like weekends when I played football and it was just growing I was going to school um, and starting to resent my dad a lot you know and it was at that time that I'd been playing for a team my dad and another parents um, had formed which was the Wolves Juniors called Oricon Wolves and I'd been or appro- well, my dad had been approached by <coughs> a guy called Ted Langford who was um he was manager of uh, Dunlop Terriers, but also he was like the uh, head scout for the Midlands of Aston Villa. And that's how kind of, um, there was a massive excitement on one part of me um, because I didn't really feel as though like I was going to go anywhere with Wolves. I was living with my dad and Villa coming in. Uh, I love John Gidman, Brian Little. I had a real, well, even though I was a Wolves supporter and, well, this is great. So I went over to train with them, uh, with, with Dunlop Terrors on a Friday night. And my dad took me, brought me back. And then when I started playing, it, it eventually meant that I had to go over on the train. And then after training at half nine, finish, I was going back on two trains and running home. Um, which for an 11 year old, 10, 11 year old, well, 11 year old, um, would you do that now? No, obviously you wouldn't. Um, so my dad was always working that's what I had to do and then at times this Ted Langford uh, would drop me back off at the at New, which he would drop me off at uh, New Street Station and uh, pick me up from there and we'd go back to his house and I'd see his wife and his two daughters uh, I didn't see much of his son but his daughters were a, one was a year younger one was a year older uh, both great people uh, the, his wife was lovely and I used to have a sandwich and a cup of tea before we went training. And I really felt as though like I was in a home because, um, and with a family, because that's what I wasn't getting. It was a really good environment when you were there then. So the girls like actually welcomed you. There was no sort of resentment, animosity about you being there. It was, it literally felt like you almost had like 
two sisters there that were just taking the mick out of you. It was it was a family, you know, and they, and they were really good to me. Um, Langford's wife was was lovely. She made me feel welcome, and I think I'd never really, like I say, I've got a really good memory, but I don't remember us really being together as a as a family, me, my brother, and my my mum and dad, and I'd never had it since. And when I went there, I felt part of the family. I felt wanted. You know, we had a laugh and a joke and they, they, they cared for us. So I'd always, um, you know, I'd, in the end, I'd always go back there. And it wasn't f- for too long, because I mean, like, which I'll explain in a second, I ended up, you know, staying there. And um, the time that I was there, uh, I could go training. I felt refreshed. Um, and then I went training there. So he picked me up from New Street. He take me from the family home to training and then from training to New Street um, so he's got these opportunities to to listen and then gather information gather information and you know from um, from knowledge and experience that I've got now obviously grooming is it's not an art to these people because these people, to be honest, you know, he he, he was a um, he knew what he was doing, and it, 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 these type of people are bastards. I mean, I don't really want to swear, but you know, it, it's like I, I think back now to how it was all developing, everything else, and. Knowing that's happened, just think, you know, it's like we talk about abuse and it's just words, you know, you hear on the um, on the TV when they're reporting something like, you know, the Savile case or, um, you know, the, this child abuse, that's it. and it's just words. You just re- hear it on the TV and, you know, even me, I just say like, okay, yeah. Because I've spoken about this to people um, who are close or who I've trusted or kind of trusted at the time. Um, and it is, it's just words, but when you think about it, the actual process and it's calculated, mm. that's why they are the people they are. And that's why, you know, you can't think of a, there's so many different ways you can describe them. But, um, when that all started, you think like this, this person is like taking a real interest in you. They're praising you. They actually care. They, 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 they value me they, and and especially at that age as well as an adult because let's let's take out of it what they are as an adult to a child they've got awareness of things that as a child you don't so you're just saying words because it's how you're feeling as a child and when they sort of notice that weakness they can just say the right things just zoom in on it and that's it and they can say oh okay and that's when it's like that, that predatory sort of thing and again it, it, it's not unique that they kind of all work the same sort of way and that's how they get themselves in. This is the key thing why this is such a powerful episode and why it's so raw because as you said, you hear these things on the news, you hear this, but you don't actually hear it. You hear the words, but what you're doing now is like you're you're giving life to it and actually explaining it, which is why it's so powerful. Uh, and you're doing an amazing job, by the way. Like I know this isn't an easy thing for you. Um, so how did this then develop from just car rides? You, know, you mentioned there that you started to live with him. Like how did this... How was he progressing this um, in hindsight? What was his sort of strategy with it all? Well, just before I go on to that, um, this is another um, this is another tactic they they use. Um, we we would we would travel to the training and um, from the house, and um, I was circumcised as a young boy. And it wasn't really a common thing at that time. And with Hurricane Wolves, the Wolves team, we didn't really have showers. We'd just get changed and then get, you know, or even, you know, just get into our jeans and get showered at home. Whereas at, at Dunlop Terriers, we'd shower at the the, um, the school, the Broadway school, it was called. Um, and we were, we were forced to not wear any pants under our shorts because of the possible effects of groin strains and stuff like that 
which is quite ironic really because I, my football career was all about my pelvic injury and groins and hernias and stuff um so when we're training it, it, we weren't allowed to wear underwear so obviously like you know some of the um the training drills after we'd uh, we'd run physically it was so demanding uh we'd be doing lots of sit-ups um lots of exercises which i know are obviously dangerous for you now for your back and your your abs and whatever um and doing loads of stretches and these positions that we were in um obviously you're not wearing any pants and this was like it's just a way of like again um them getting their fix almost getting their fix and then like afterwards we'd always have to have a shower and then there's a guy called and i don't care i mean he's dead now but i don't care whether it's whatever but he deserves to be uh, his name deserves to be out there anyway dave pitt um he was a photographer of the sports argus which was a pink sports paper that was out every week and he'd take photographs of uh, different teams in different leagues because obviously it was a massive I think it was a Birmingham boys league but I think they had Castle Vale league which was reported in there as well and um, he was the official photographer and yet he used to come to uh, to the, the training and um, take photographs of us in the shower and getting changed and the difference with the lads in Birmingham it was all banter We'd have a laugh with the Oricon Wolves team, but it was just a laugh. It was naive and just kids having a laugh and whatever. But with the lads at, um, at Dunlop, it was like, it was as though it was a different level, you know, and they just used to take the piss out of him. Do you know, oh, he's, he's bound a pervert and whatever. It was almost treated like a laugh. No one really knew what it was really about. How, did, how do you think, as a collective, do you think that everyone kind of knew? Because again, it's your kids, you don't really understand what's going on. Do you think you kind of used banter as a collective way to deal with this thing that was going on, or, or literally completely oblivious to it? Well, one of the, 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 the kids there, when I went back and I, I first reported and I walked into the police station, um, one of the paedophile officers, detectives, was one of the players it was in the older group of players. And he said, I can't believe this. It's so obvious what was going on. But even now I didn't click. Wow. So even 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 like when he's a, in the PD4 unit, he didn't, he, he didn't he didn't A because he's got no need to at that time because it hasn't really come about. It was only because I was he was alerted to me reporting it and he couldn't be the detective on it because of our relationship. Yeah. So it wasn't, I mean, like, you know, again, just fast forward a little bit and then I'll go back, but we used to go to Sweden every year. So we'd go to Trelleborg and we'd play games over there. Um, and while we're there, like, you know, on the coach, this Langford would dive on people like myself and other one or two or three others, others that I know were abused as well, but I wouldn't have thought it at the time because mm -hmm. they weren't that kind of character. Mm -hmm. Um, and it, it, it smothered us in love bites. And if you think about it, your, your kids go into Sweden, you're coming back from a tour, which the tours themselves were unbelievable, by the way, you know, as in the, the, the teams we play. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but then you come home and you pick your kid up off, a, off the coach, or, you know, because I think we used to go over, um, we used to go over f by ferry and then. Um, get picked up obviously I think we went to Germany first and then um, then Sweden so when we got drops off like you got love bites all over and you even then like you know you think if that was my kid well where's that come from yeah. you're 11 years of age yeah. 12 years of age 13 years of age which is the I went three times there um, and it's just not normal to think that you know and there weren't just one love bite you smothered in them and you, you wouldn't you wouldn't say anything. But is that is that is that down to not saying anything uh, out of the fear of being left out of the team? Is it a fear of like what? Why? Why do you think? Because yeah, it's also hard because at that age, as, as kid at that age, and again, anyone listening to this, uh, as in listening to the audience, it takes us back to when you're that age. Because that's what I'm doing when you're talking to me. I'm trying to because this, this part of the story I didn't know any of this stuff, so I'm taking myself back to when I was playing football at that age and thinking, well, wow, like I can't even comprehend this stuff. 
so why do you think that is then? Why why didn't you speak up? Why didn't you say anything? Was it because it was a fear of this person? Did they put a fear into you? Was it you didn't want to be an outsider for your team? What, looking back now, what do you think was that reason? Um, it's, it's not about being out, out the team. That wasn't just being out the team. It, it, there was there was lots of different things that contributed to how, how you were feeling because I think that happened after I'd start being I'd started to being abused, and then like you know, there's a pattern from when you start to get abused and how it continues and how it becomes the norm and accepted and like you're almost oblivious and you're almost numb to it. Yeah. Um, so, but what I was trying to point out was like, you know, the, the things that were happening in the showers, the love bites, um, the, the, the banter about the, you know, me being circumcised when people weren't and that they, they have, they have a, they have a way of like, embarrassing you and and giving you um negative stuff which we know is negative now didn't even know that word when i was younger but negative stuff that you would that puts you down so when i was living with my dad i'd be put down a lot it was always my fault things went went wrong it's always dave's fault it's always this that, and the other and whether it was you know my mom or in different circumstances not my mom sorry my, my dad and uh, my uh, my nan's uh, my granddad was brilliant, you know he was, um, but my nan was quite harsh with me, um, so I'd always been put down as well. <coughs> Excuse me, and um, they he would have Langford when when we were in the dressing room, he'd take the piss out of me about being circumcised. He'd be saying like the lads are looking at you, you know, but don't worry about it or this, you know, or it, it'd say something more negative towards me. Then when we get in the car he would be praising me and saying how great I am. And so it's this like, you know, saying one thing and then the opposite. So basically it really fucks you up, excuse my language. So he's basically, he's basically the one that's bringing you down, making you feel inferior about things you weren't, confirming all the, the fact that you're not good enough and you're stupid, you're this and you're an outcast and whatever it is, all giving you all these reasons. And then in the car, he's then giving you all the praise to bring you back up again. So as a child, again, you potentially wouldn't have maybe connected the dots because you'd just been feeling a certain way and not necessarily understanding it was him that was doing it. But you would have understood when it was just you two in the car, you would have understood that he's the one that's making me feel better, not knowing that it's the circle of he's made you feel crap in the first place because you're in a big team environment and you probably wouldn't have paid that much attention. So again, that's also then part of the whole process. So how did that then develop? Um, Well, you know, then just kind of saying to me oh what a great player I am and what ability I've got and you're going to go all the way and <clears throat> it's funny because I've spoken to play, players who were at that level and, and they've recently you know the last two or three years and they were saying to me how good I was and they thought I used to get special treatment from him because of my ability um, which I didn't believe at the time um, so when he was telling me all of this I didn't really believe that um, I was just great and everything. When I was playing for my own teams, I knew I was the best player. But it's funny when I went there, I didn't. Um, and then he said, like one of the things that you know is is a problem for us is, um, you know, you you need your rest type of thing. And going home, it's not safe. You know, I'm dropping you off at half nine. You're getting two trains, and you're having to run, you know, a mile and a half, two miles, two and a half miles back home, and it's when you get to Stairbridge, you, you, you get dropped off in one um, station, then you catch a, like a shuttle to the town. And from the from that shuttle station, you have to either catch the bus where you have to wait at the station and it's late, mm. or you you could run home, but you're going past pubs and closing time was half 10 in those days, quarter to 11. So it's quite scary, really. Um, and I used to say, obviously, this in our conversation in the car, and then he just said, look, you know what I'll do is I'll ask your dad to see whether you can come and stay with me. And I'm going, brilliant. Mm. That'd be absolutely fantastic because your family make me um, make me feel at home, and you know I love being there, and you're so kind and all this kind of stuff. And I felt really good about it, and and all this, and I had a word with my dad, and my dad was oblivious. And the next thing I know, I'm I'm staying in a guy's house, which would change my life really. Mm -hmm. um, and it started straight away. Almost instantly. 
Well, the first, we, we'd gone training. It was just on a, f- a Friday night, I'd say. <coughs> so we'd train on a Friday night, um, go training, come back. Um, and I'd have some some dinner, some sandwich or some dinner, whatever his, his wife had made. Um, the kids would go, and the, she would go to bed around about 10, quarter past 10. So um, I'd sleep on the sofa. They'd bring a, a sleeping bag out and a pillar. And... Um, and that's that's how I would sleep, and then um, they'd go to bed, and then he just sat down, sofas here, chairs there, TVs there, rug here, another chair at the back of the, the settee. Um, there's like veranda doors, dining table, kitchen off the side, and the first thing he, he did was. Um, he said, like, you know, I talked about football and how good you are. And he says, but you're small, aren't you? So you're too small, you, you know, you you need to mature. Otherwise, Aston Villa are not going to take you. And I said, well, OK, um, what do I do? You know, and he says, it's all right, you've got plenty of time. And then he says, you've got lots of puppy fat on you. Um, and again... You know, you think like later on in my life, I can remember David Pleat saying when we played Luton for Villa, uh, he said in the team talks, I knew one or two of the players there, he said like, you know, just mark the chunky lad. Don't make sure the chunky lad doesn't do this or when you get the ball, get at the chunky lad at right back. And you think like, you know, that wouldn't even bother anybody. But to me, it struck a chord because the first thing he said to me was, I was fat and... Um, he said, like, you know, I've got this cream. <laughs> and he said, like, you know, other well, players, loads of players have had this done. I've had good to stay here. You know, I don't know whether that's a true. I, I take it as not because I asked him, right? um, while was, all this was going on. He said, no, I never stayed there. I never did anything um, or been with, with at the Longfords and whatever. And so I know what he was saying was a lie to me, um, but basically took the... Um, he took the, got the cream and he said like, you know, just, I think I had shorts on or something like that. I said, take your shorts down and your pants. And he started rubbing this cream into my backside. He said, this is what breaks the fat down. Um, and you need it breaking down. Otherwise, like, you know, you probably won't get taken on now. What you have to understand is at that age, we didn't have academies. We had, um, you could train with football clubs from 11 to 14 and then you sign associate schoolboy forms and then from associate schoolboy forms you were tied to the club but while you were training there you were able to go and have trials elsewhere um so for me signing for Aston Villa and the whole thing with the lads and everything I was completely and utterly um taken in Mm -hmm. uh like I say, I love Brian Little, love John Gidman, love the Villa kit. In fact, my first kit was a Villa kit, even though I was a wall supporter. Look, look, look at Villa, because around that sort of time, Villa were a very, very big team. They, 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 they always have been. I think when they were in the third division, they were getting 50,000, um, 50, or 40,000 or whatever. But big crowds and, you know, it was a massive club. And You've basically been sold a dream of, you can come and play for this amazing team. I'm not talking about my friend. You can, you can come and play for this massive team. Um but you have to do these things, you have to follow these steps. Well, it wasn't, you have to follow these steps. It was like, you are an amazing player. You have got everything going for you, but you're fat. You've got a fat arse. That's what he said to me, or fat bum or whatever it was at the time. And so it needs breaking down. And I'm there like, you know, straight away. I can remember thinking, what's what's he doing? Mm. Because <clears throat> don't forget, I'd, for the first time in my life as well, I'd been taking my um, taking my kit off and getting showered in a situation. Never done that before. Um, and that was very hard because the fact is I was circumcised and not many others were. So it was an embarrassing situation when I was <clears throat> in the dressing room alone. And then when this guy's like saying, like, take that off and then told me to turn around and then Basically, when I turned around again, he brushed past me and he says, was that a touch? Now, in his eyes and his days and his language, a touch was, have you got an erection? 
and um, I'm a young lad and I didn't know what it was and um, he just had a laugh about it and then I think it was that that night I just like got my shorts back on and uh, lay on the couch and while he came to me and said right I'm going to bed now so he went to bed and I'm sitting there and I'm thinking like you know or lying there thinking well you know is that what I've got to go through is that what I've got to go through? Um, is this what professional football, if he's saying like people like, like, you know, I shouldn't really mention his name, but this is what he said. There's not, there's nothing to say it was ever happened with, but he was just saying that. And uh, You don't know the difference though. And this is the thing is no. you just, you, he's just name dropping. He's name dropping. You've got no way of fact checking this information at the time. So all he's just doing is, oh, well, this player's done this, this player's done that. And you're none the wiser. And like I said, it, 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 it's a complete abuse of power could be abuse of power and again the knowledge and information they had and knowing full well that you getting into Villa would change your life around and just using that to his advantage and this is one of the biggest things that we've spoke about about this that I said off air was one of the things you've had to go through with this is your body's reaction and that was something that like working with a professional uh you've, you've had to overcome and come through that the, the shame of that because that's something that I'd never considered in that situation from a male or a female's perspective that when that's happening to you your body is still going to respond in a certain way. And I know that's something you've had to really deal with and like professionally worked through. So can you talk about how, um, actually having a professional talk about that, because the way you explained it on that walk was really, very really powerful about, um, th 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 there's nothing, in, that's nothing to do with you because that was something that you had a lot of shame and guilt over for a long time. Well, I mean, like at the end of the day, when, um, <laughs> Again, when it happens to you, the, you know, the first time I remember the fight, and if you, if you want me to explain that, I will do, you know, and the only reason I will say, because I mean, like, I am, it is uncomfortable to talk about, but um, I don't know, again, to, to reach anybody who's been through it, it's just like saying, okay, this is how it was with me the very first time I was, I was touched. Um, the week after, he's saying like, you know, oh, you know, you've trained hard. Da da da. Uh, Got to keep like the cream went on again, and and then he turned around and said like, you know, um, basically, have you had a wank? I'm eleven years of age, and I said, what do you mean? I said, I don't know what wank is. Believe it or not. Uh, I believe it because at that age, you really shouldn't really be. No, and. Um, he said, have you, have, you, have you been able to to come? And I said, well, I don't understand. And he says, well, if, if, if you aren't able to come, basically, then you've got no chance of Villa taking you on. You're not mature enough. And um, I was, like, you know, shocked and almost devastated because basically he's telling me I'm not going to be taken on because there's something I can't do and I haven't done which I didn't know anything about and um, that's that's when you when you look back you think what the fuck was I doing there what why am I in this situation? But when you're actually in that situation, you're 11 years of age, you're being told um, by somebody, a man, that unless you do this, the dreams that you've had from when I was so young, and just, it's never gonna happen. And you presume like, you know, you don't even think of other clubs or anything like that, you just think of where you are then. And basically, he told me to to start wanking, playing with myself, and I didn't I didn't know what to do, so he did it, and he went on for ages anyway, and nothing happened. Obviously, I was too young. And um, he said to me when he finally finished, and I was just a member as well, you know, he, 
he'd either be doing it and having his hand down his own trousers. He never exposed himself to me. Um, or he'd have, he'd be doing it and he'd be smoking his Park Drive cigarette right down to the end. His fingers were yellow. He had a beard. And he swear he's tracksuit bottoms and whatever and it was repulsive um and then when he'd had enough he said i'm going to bed now he said it's like you need to um you need to practice when you get home so by the time you come next time um you're able to do it so the next time when i got back there i told him i'd been practicing which i hadn't and that happened just a couple of weeks on the trot. And then he had a go at me for not, you're obviously not practicing or whatever. Um, and it's, this was every Friday night. So when I leave school and go on a train and then get picked up and go to his house and have the, the sandwiches and the drink and then go training and then get him embarrassed at training and then coming back, I'd still love the training. And the lads were brilliant. But then I knew what I was getting back into, but I didn't even realise that because when I got home to theirs, I had some sandwiches or some food and a cup of tea and some banter with his daughters. And that was great because it was still family. And then as soon as... They had no idea. And they had no... Well, I don't know whether his, his wife had any idea or not because why would, you know... It's not natural for a bloke to be downstairs for an hour till 11, half 11 with an 11-year-old. So I don't know. I don't know, but... You know, as soon as they got up and they went to bed, then I knew it was all going to happen again. And that's when the, the fear, I suppose, and um, the embarrassment and, um, and, and just that, that feeling of, I don't know, um, anger and loss as well i mean like you know what why would someone like you don't think at this moment in time that anything is wrong because you don't know any different and you're brainwashed into thinking you have to do this and this happens to all the players this happens to all the kids they have to be able to do this before and again to be honest we can talk about it later but like when i heard the, the statements in court when i got him sent down or i initiated getting him sent down it was the same spiel to all the other lads so at that point as well like i even felt at like 42 or 41 42 years of age that for fuck's sake i wasn't even that special anyway and that's at 42 years of age that is when you told me that that is one of the most powerful things anyone's ever said to me that that's how someone made you feel that that's that in that situation all that's happened that was what popped into your head that it's I mean that's it's um you by the way they're, they're, you're doing incredible here they're, they're, you like absolutely awesome um in that situation and you because yeah it went on for for how long did it go on for roughly years wise this is what I'm saying like so every Friday night and then because um he would say right you know if you you come over on Friday night after training, stay over. If Villarreal were at home, we'd go and watch the team. And obviously, I don't know where he did it. And this is what, just you know, fast tracking with the civil case, I, I went out with Villa at the end and said, oh, he's got nothing to do with Villa. He's, he wasn't as scared, he's got nothing to do. We used to go in the physio's room and the dressing rooms when Ron Saunders was manager. And if he'd got nothing to do with the club, how could you get, gain entrance into that? But we'd go to a game and then we'd like set up his stuff or put away his stuff. He was a DJ at the Crown and Cushion in, in um, Perry Bar. Um, and he'd say, well, we'll go and do that. We'll go and do this. And you can stay over Saturday night. And then your dad can pick you up after the game, take you home after the game on a Sunday. So initially it was for one night, Friday nights, and then it became Friday and Saturday. So you're looking at between two and a half and three years every more or less every weekend and mentally where were you at during that time because as you said at the time you don't really know 
what's going on you you kind of got a sense of it's not really right your body and like you said this is a bit weird but kind of everyone's doing it but looking back now mentally where were you at and what did that period of time actually do to you I think at the, at the time it was um I hated it every single time. Like I say, I'd go training, have dinner and whatever, and they go to bed. Up to that point, I used to love it. And then after that point, I always used to know when they used to get up, when his wife used to say, right, I'm going up to bed now, let's, the girls would go to bed. The, the, the lad wasn't there a lot of the time anyway. I always knew it was going to happen. Um, I didn't understand why it became, because if I go back and when he had a go at me, I went back and I did, practice if you like and I succeeded and I rang him up and he's and uh, this is just thinking about my child at the pub we had we had a phone downstairs but if you picked it up upstairs you could hear and I knew my dad had um had listened in on my phone calls because I told this Langford that because one day um I spoke to my mate um and we were going up the woods uh and i told him like i'm gonna i'll bring the knife so as an 11 year old i was bringing a knife um not to be guilty of someone thinking about knife crime but it's just so he could cut whatever up in the, the woods but my dad had heard me and he had to go at me saying like taking a knife out with you um so this particular occasion i I couldn't wait to get on the phone. It was a pay phone as well. So you had to put money in downstairs in the old off license. Um, I said, uh, guess what? I can't, I can't believe it. I've done it. I've done it. And this is what you've done. And I told him. And I'm really, really excited about saying right this. Why am I excited? A, because like, now they are going to take me. Mm. And B, I don't have to do it anymore. But then he just, just escalated and... Um, I think even though I felt really uncomfortable about it before that, I kind of put up with it because I had no choice because Villa weren't going to take me. And then after that, it was like, um, I started to get angry at my dad. I started to hate my dad. Um, what do you know what was? Um... I love my dad so much. I love my dad. I know he's watching over me every second and he's probably up there now just having a a little say to himself, thankfully you're finally getting it out. You're um, doing a very good job, by the way. Sorry? You're doing a very good job. Yeah. Um, thank you. Um, I started hating him because like, all I wanted was like my dad. You know, and I was in a situation where I was having to go through this and believe it or not well you will believe it the more I spoke about it Langford would always add fuel to the fire about why I should hate my dad more or be against him more so that was fueling it and fueling it and fueling it and um, to rebel against my dad um, I would steal cigarettes and smoke cigarettes because I know how he hated them. My dad had a serious um, perforated also, I think it is, where he nearly died. And the last thing he wanted for me to do was to even think about smoking. And it's the last thing I would ever want my child to think. So I understand it. But as well, uh, we're in the pub and um, my dad used to spend hours and hours doing the books. My dad was a brilliant publican. His beer was great. He looked after it. Everybody loved him, he got on with everybody. Fantastic at what he did. Um, but I knew if he was short, he would spend hours trying to work it out. So I used to nick a five or a time off him at the safe. And every time I did it, I did it out of real anger. Um, And I, I, even now, I don't, obviously, I won't condone stealing to anybody, but I, w I don't regret it because at that particular time, I was, um, I was, I was on my own, really. 
It was your was it was your cry for help almost without crying for help or was it was it a real like fuck you because because you were going through all this pain and it's because I know now you work with kids like um like they're going through some stuff yeah. and it's people are looking at the results what the kids are actually doing and it's like well just don't do this don't do that but they're not looking at what's causing it they're looking at the effect so what the effect was you were doing all this stuff but the cause actually was because you were going through all this stuff you were made to hate your dad resent your dad but all you really wanted was your dad and essentially the one person who could have saved you was the one person you're trying to hurt because he didn't know and he didn't know because of what you've been fed so was it were you doing it as a cry for help or were you doing it as more of like a fu to him or was it kind of a mixture of both i think it was both really because half, half the time you want to get caught out but then when you want you get caught out you, you want to carry on doing it because nothing's been done about it you know i i I'd, i've listened to so many statements and i've read books of the guys who've been abused and believe me there's there's a lot more um, of the abuse that was more severe, even though every single bit of abuse and the emotional side of it is the same anyway. But um, I played football um, to escape or to, to be away from anything that's going off in my head. Um, my dad used to come and watch, used to criticise me as well. So it was all round of stuff, criticising me, judging me and not good enough and whatever, you know. Um, people in the pub would say, oh, he's a lovely lad, what a lovely smile. This guy's really cheeky, yeah, but look at his hands, look at his trousers, look at his shoes, scruffy, this, that and the other. So I generally felt run down and then knowing what I was going through with... Um, at Langford's house, you know, and, and having to, and don't forget as well, like I'm, I'm going through all this and I'm wondering whether the lads know. Mm. I'm wondering whether they know they, they're like, I'm like some teacher's pet. Mm. Why is it the house, you know, and I'm not saying they knew about the abuse, but it's like, it was more, it was embarrassing, like, you know, the, the connection between me and him. I mean, he had it with another lad, a very good friend of mine. Um, and one of my best friends at the time, um, but with me, it was different because I was staying at the house and, and my dad was like, you know, oblivious, but he was oblivious because in my opinion, he didn't care. So if he didn't care about me, fuck him. Mm -hmm. And I used to, you know, have the cigarettes and I used to have like the, the fiver and I started like, you know, thinking, well, if you think I'm scruffy or whatever, you know, let's see what you think about this. So I just started getting more and more scruffy and dirty and whatever. And I will embarrass you in front of your friends. Do you know what I mean? So, you know, there was a time when I, I, I me and my brother, we used to train together. Me and my brother did everything. And one day we're in the, we had a flat cellar and we'd be running over the, uh, the smaller barrels jumping off, touching the wall, coming back on the barrels and back to the wall and timing ourselves. And because I was trying to beat his time, I slipped down four of the barrels and my knee came up like that. And I was scared to tell my dad. I said to me, brother, don't, don't tell him. Because he'd judge me and ridicule me. And there was a time when I was coming, I was racing my brother home. He was on the bus, so I was on my bike, going uphill. I went head, head over the, the handlebars bus stopped that far away from me it just touched my head my brother got off thinking like you know what's happened what's happened but I landed on my knee and again my knee came out please don't tell dad so this is the kind of feeling I had mm -hmm. so yeah fuck him you know weren't there for me nobody was there for me and this is this is why you know the um this is why Friday and Saturday nights and it was really, because I was training at Villa as well at the time. I used to go over Wednesday nights and I was training at the club at Villa Park. And we either used to be on the old car park, which all the Villa lads will know, or we went down the steps under the cell. It was underneath the old reception. Incredible building. And these are the great things I remember. Do you know what I mean? These are the, the things where you turn around and say, well, I'm not saying it was worth it. But what I'm saying is like, you know, I've had all this shit, but this is where I am. And you're training with Bill Shorthouse, 
the reserve manager was Wolves, um, a Wolves top Wolves player in the fifties. Keith Leonard, Brian Little occasionally, Roy McLaren. So like this, this, this is what this is. This is me. This is what my dream dreams all about. But then you go back to reality, and every Friday and Saturday, you're going through what you're going through. Mm-hmm. And then you go home, and you know you're getting criticised for not doing your own work or for skiving school. And you're thinking, well, hold on, me. And I, I didn't think that at the time, but this is what I thought after. Is the well, what do you expect? Mm-hmm. You know, you've got no interest in me. A grown man's doing whatever he's doing to me, and then. I'm being threatened with like not being good enough for Villa because I can't do this, and you're worried about me frigging homework. Because of perspective, don't it? And you think like you know you you worried about me like you know skiving off school, and then when I skive off school, and then you don't say anything the next day, say so make sure you go to school next uh, today. By the way, I'm not I'm not driving you in the two miles to school. You'd have to walk. Do you know what I mean? And all this thing, and this is this this is all resentment from when I had then. But what you have to remember is I love my dad. You know, when he died of um, a brain hemorrhage and it was one of the hardest things that I've ever had to to deal with because as much as he was what he was, I know he loved me and I know he was proud of me. Mm-hmm. He just couldn't say it, whether that, that was the era or whatever. You know, he worked hard, he worked hard in his pub and, you know, he had to make it a success. So I understand that now, but at that time as a kid, yeah. you know... I didn't, I didn't see or know about that. My dad was a good man. He would do anything for anybody, you know, and I just wish at that time, I say I wish at the time, listen, we have our experiences. We're here to experience whatever we experience, and I believe in one way we almost agree to that before we come. Um, so all of the experiences I've had have brought me where I am now, and life's been shit at times, but how... How those challenges develop is is where where we are and what we're made of and at that particular time um the situation i was going through even though i see it differently now um i hated my dad for putting me through what i was going through mm-hmm. with a vengeance i almost wanted a um i used to go and watch wolves play every week home and away and There'd always be trouble. Not that I was in the trouble, even though my brother said he can remember me being in trouble. Um, there was always violence and stuff in those days. Mm. So, um, so yeah, that was that. That that's what I thought about my dad, um, and it, it it got to a it got to a stage where the abuse was getting more and more frequent, and then that became there was there was a couple of instances where. Because as you get older as well, like, you know, you start questioning it. All of a sudden you, excuse me again, but you know what a wank is. You know that um, a man does not do this. Going on to your point now, a man doesn't doesn't do this to a boy. Mm-hmm. And I think half of the... Uh, I've lived all my life in fear and I've never known what it is. And you go back to counselling and what have you taken out of it? And I... I discovered something by talking to a um, a really good lady. Um, she's the wife of another f- professional footballer, so she knows the life of, of football. Um, and I, I I've suffered like you know kind of from a paranoia um, to a, a really bizarre degree where I think I'd be going down the road, and if I saw someone in a van, a white van, I'd be um, they're going to kidnap me. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Beat me up or something. And you think, well, where does all this come from? And she once said to me, like, you know, when we were talking about it, she said, like, you know, one of the biggest, um, the biggest shame and guilt from a, a boy in particular is um, how they can be aroused or the fact that they have been aroused by a, another man. So by him arousing me, I've my I've, I'm erect because of another man touching me. And in your head, even though you're 11, 12, 13 years of age, you don't relate to that being a grown man, having full control of, you know, kind of abusing you. And at the end of the day, it's a physical touch. It's not me 
um, giving my permission. Mm -hmm. It's a physical um, reaction to the stimulus of him touching me. Yeah. But in your head, you feel as though like you have, you you have, um, you've been turned on or whatever. So, and that's bad enough when you understand it. When you don't understand it, it's a million times worse. And confusing. And confusing. Um, and that stays with you until someone unlocks it. Yeah. Um, and like I say, she, she the counsellor, like, explained it to me, lots of victims feel the same. Now, again, shame and guilt is like just two words. But you put that deep in it, right. <sighs> you put that deep inside, you know, kind of um, things you battle with. And it actually means something. Mm -hmm. And then once you get through that and you understand that, you know, you still have the same shame and guilt until you find out the next thing which can help you get through it. Um, and I've seen lots of counsellors, you know, I've had some really, really good people and I'm going to go back to our conversation, like when we had a walk and that, I think like, you know, what you explained to me just brings it home in a lot of ways, so. What part, what key parts of the conversation that we had, again, for anyone listening, that what was, what was something that you can take from that? that I think um, the best way to explain it is like when we'd go on to the, the other things that I've experienced, yeah. because that that's when it's, I think the, I think the feeling of where I was and um, and what I actually did was um, will be easy to explain it all. So complete transparency here. We've just taken a bit of a break, uh, sort of regroup ourselves because again, it's not just me and Dave that are involved in this. Obviously, got the team. Uh, Dave's uh, got team here as well. So we basically taken a bit of a break, regrouped ourselves, uh, and then we're going in for the second part again. So um, the last thing we were talking about was the aftermath of this Dave so um this is where it gets deep this is like the, the the real emotional stuff here because um obviously I know you were doing stuff when it comes to your dad and trying to have an, a bit of an outlet um but it got pretty dark for you with a suicide attempt can we have a bit of a conversation about that because that's I know there's something we want to talk about and sort of deep dive into this so can you talk to me about where this sort of was on the time frame and where you sort of were emotionally during this time um, well, at the time that uh, that I um, tried to take my own life, I was 14 years of age, would come out of the pub trade, um, moved over to my stepmother's mother's house in, um, in Birmingham. Uh, so it was my stepmother, my dad, me, and um, my stepmother's mother. Um, and while we're living there, we were in, obviously living in Birmingham. Uh, and it was just like shortly before, um, I'm not sure around about, it must have been when I was about 13, 14, I can't remember the exact month or whatever, but obviously while I was living there, I didn't have to stay with Langford so much. And, um, and but because of that, he started to almost stalk us. Um, me and another player, uh, goalkeeper, um, we played like uh, like a pitch and put golf game uh, close to where um, I was living, and this is really bizarre. Again, like you know, we were, we we had a sit down and we we're saying like you know we were talking about um, Langford and they used to call him Ted bullshit, and um, we really everybody knew he was Ted bullshit, um, and we were saying to each other like you know he's, he's starting to get possessive of both of us, but me in particular. And then we just joked, like, wouldn't it be funny if we turned around and he's, you could see his head popping out of a, a bush. Um, and we turned around and his head was popping out of the <laughs> bush. No word of a lie. And it followed us. This is a grown man following us. And how we knew where we were and whatever and where we were going, no idea. He also turned up at the bus uh, train station, bus station in Stourbridge, 
when I was talking to her, I was kind of half seeing a, a girl at the time, we were good friends with her. And uh, he he was there at the end of school time. And he came over to talk to her, and this is how brazen he was. He showed her a picture of me naked in the showers that this Dave Pitt had, um, had taken. And she was going like, is he sick or whatever? And this is the type of bloke he was. So when all this was going on, I was unhappy at home, missing my brother, um, got a knee problem, a two year knee fracture, which I didn't know was two years at the time, but a two year fracture. I just thought it was a, I had a knee problem. So things weren't, you know, I weren't happy playing football. I was missing my brother. Langford was following us and, and whatever. And I was unhappy living in the house. So I ran away from home a couple of times. And then eventually, um, a while afterwards, we moved into our own house back in uh, near Stourbridge, a place called Lye. And uh, my dad was working now at Leyland, which he worked for before he went into the trade. Um, a friend of mine um, at school, uh, my best friend, um, he used to take tablets for, um, for anger. And they used to make him feel a bit dozy and whatever. And he said to me one night when I was over there, he said like, you know, I ain't taking these anymore. Can you get rid of them for me? So he gave me three bottles of these tablets and I put them in my bag. And like most schoolboys of that age, they never empty the bags and I never emptied my bag. Uh, and my dad found it and um, he said, what are these? I said, well, they're paws. He wanted me to get rid of them because he didn't want to take them anymore. And I don't know what his thoughts were, but I don't know where he thought he was pushing them or whatever, but he said, right, you know, I'm not having this, da, da, da. you're not seeing him anymore. So, which obviously is so unfair because he didn't know the situation, it was just something that he assumed. So at this particular time, I was living in our own house. Um, my stepmother, Jill, she loved me. She, she loved me, but I don't think she could have children and it felt at the time she didn't love me because she was part of the relationship between me, uh, her and my dad, and my dad didn't really have time for me, even when he was working at Leyland, never really had the time. I'd got an injury that my, my knee was in absolute bits for at least 18 months. Um, my dad used to um, come home and he, I'd be complaining of it and at the weekends or whatever. Um, and I always used to go running with my dad, um, even from the age of whenever, when I first went to live with him. Um, whenever we could, especially in holidays and stuff. And he said, there's nothing wrong with you. So we used to go running and you know yourselves, like, you know, if you've got, um, say an injury, there are certain injuries that you, once you've started running or doing an activity, then it heats up. Mm -hmm. And so it feels okay-ish, yeah. not, not as severe. So we'd go for five mile runs and up and down hills and all this kind of stuff. and. For a while, it was really painful because um, it was the edge of the kneecap. Um, and then I'd be fine. And then I'd come home and then whatever. And then I'd play the game on a Sunday and I was in bits. So football was always an escape for me. I couldn't play football anymore because I was in absolute agony. I was living in a place where I didn't want to be. I missed my brother so much. Um, I wasn't playing for Rick and Wolves anymore, so I didn't see him every other weekend or every weekend. Uh, my best mate, um, who I couldn't see anymore. So he was my only, my own, the only thing I had. Mm -hmm. um, my mum couldn't have me living with her because my stepfather didn't want me. And it, I couldn't go back there. So I didn't want to live, live with my dad. I couldn't live with my mum because my stepfather. I couldn't go back to my nan and granddad's because they were getting older and it wasn't fair on them. So no football, no best friend, no this, no that, no whatever. Nobody wants me. And I'm talking to you now and saying it, nobody wants me. It's just words. You go back to being 14 year, years of age and having all that going on and you're being abused as well. So you're being uh, manipulated, you're being abused and you know it's wrong. There's a couple of times, the last couple of times I was abused. One after training, he put me, he said to me to go in the back of the van. He said, I want you to take your trousers down and, and play yourself in, in the back. So I'm not doing that. I said, the buses can see me and all this. He said, you do it. And he was really aggressive. And then we stopped on, I think it was Brecon Hills. And we was overlooking all the, the lights. This is on a Friday night. 
after training the pitch dark and he's getting me to play myself in the back and then jumping over into the front of his seat and basically wanting to put a Durex on. And I'm saying I'd have never put one on, I don't want to, never have, never wanted to and whatever. And it still psychologically sits in my head. And then he puts it on me and then being really aggressive and everything, then all of a sudden he switches and then he goes home, doesn't even stay up that night for the first time, just goes straight to bed. When I spoke to the police, they said like, you know, in his head he was thinking, I'm going to the next level here. For some reason it changed, whatever the thoughts were. So I've got this in my head, now I'm terrified as well as going back to his house and, and being abused twice a week, and I'm terrified because I don't, my last recollection of him, he's going to do something violent to me. Um, so I've got that and I've got all the other things and I know what it's like, you know, you know, when you're in an unhappy relationship or you're in an unhappy home or something, you've always got a choice when you're an adult to, to leave and go somewhere. However bad it is or however sad or however desperate you feel, you've always got somewhere to go. You know, as a 14-year-old kid, like so many 14-year-olds, 13-year-olds, 12-year-olds, 15-year-olds, whatever, now, you can't, you, you haven't got a choice of where you go. So nobody wants you. You don't want to be where you are. You're being abused. The only thing that you've got to look forward to is your football, and that's, you can't do that because you're in pain. I wanted to die. I really, really wanted to die. And this is, again, you know, the, the funny side of it is I come home from school, I took the dog away. We had a beautiful dog, Sabre, Bel uh, German Shepherd. And I was walking, I thought, you know, fuck it, I'm going to my mates. So I went to see Paul and um, we had like, you know, about half an hour, 45 minutes, but it was a good hour's walk. So when I got back, I knew I was going to get a bollocking from my stepmother. Um, and she'd probably think, well, I'm with Paul or whatever. And I already didn't want to didn't want to, I had nothing, I didn't think I had anything to live for. Um, and when I was walking home, I thought, you know what, I'm going to do it tonight. Um, just don't want to be here. And then I got back home and Jill had a go at me, my stepmother. And um, I went upstairs and I thought, you know what, I'm, I'm hungry. So I thought I'm going to have my dinner first. And as I was downstairs, my dad came and he saw that I'd been crying. He said, what's up? And uh, I said nothing. And Jill said like where I'd been and all this. And for the first time in my life, my dad, or I felt that my dad really had a little bit of compassion towards me. Almost as though like um, he wanted to understand. But then we had, we had the meal and I went upstairs and I started writing a letter in fact, I didn't start, I finished the letter. And it was one which my stepmother kept until she died. Because we found it in a handbag when she'd passed away. And um, I said, like, you know, how much I hate my dad and Jill. Or how much I hate my dad and I hate Jill for taking my dad away from me. And, you know, other stuff as well, like, but that was the crux of it. And uh, I finished writing the letter and I put it down on the, on the side. And I had, um, my bedroom was pretty cool. Um, it was only a small bedroom and you walk in and then my bed was like raised on breeze blocks, not on anything mm. else, but it was raised. And I had like stuff underneath, like where I could, sometimes I'd just go under and, and sit under and stuff. Um, so the bed was raised and you had to get up and down and whatever and I put the I put the letter on the side and then um I was just looking at read it again and then I just I just had this overwhelming um feeling I guess. Um I don't think like, you know, I should really explain what I did, but um basically what I did I did I did what I did and then came back into the, the bedroom and I was just crying uncontrollably. Um, my dad heard me, obviously, and he came up and said, what have you done? And he saw, obviously, whatever was on the table. Um, uh, and also the letter, and, and he was in shock and he more or less pushed me down the stairs. Um, and I'm starting to, like, you know, not really 
know where I am at this stage and I got in the he put me in the car in our little in my dad's mini it was like um it was an old mini but it was a, <laughs> a blue one and it was like it it was really fast and whatever and um he was in there and he was just again he showed me this love and concern that I'd not heard from him and then I can remember being in hospital sitting on the chair while he was at reception believe it or not and the next thing I know I was having um having my stomach pumped and then waking up a couple of days later in hospital and the thing I'd like to say I man is that obviously we're going to talk about other stuff in a minute but people say like you know when you even though I was only 14 but I'm talking about anybody that you're selfish when you um when you you try and do that kind of thing and in some cases you know if if it's a cry for help um, but these people who say it's a selfish thing have never really experienced it and I can only really talk from my own situation it's, it's three times one of them was a cry for help and the other two I didn't have any choice in at all because I was overcome with, the, with, with such, such strong feelings of emotion of desperation of sadness of loneliness of um feeling like nobody nobody wants you and you've got nowhere to go anywhere you ain't got anywhere to go you can't go and get a flat you can't go and do this you can't go and live with your mate you can't do this because the law says you can't do it so you're stuck in the situation you're in and that's just my situation so if you have no choice in it because you're overcome with this this emotion that's not being selfish that's reaching the depths the darkest depths that you can ever go to and every single person who does it is is an individual and they have their own individual place where they go to but why why would you take your life why would you want to kill yourself when people look at it and and look at it as though it's a self why why would why would anybody want to take their life when when they're 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 in that place it's because they're they are desperate they are lonely they are sad but then you go a step further when you don't have a choice in it because the way you feel about being desperate lonely sad and all that you're that you're that you're that you're that deep into it then your 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 own decisions are taken away from you and you're not in your own frame of mind and that's essentially what it is even as adults because people say as a kid, yeah, I had no choice. But as an adult, you have a choice. And I don't think people quite understand, especially if you've never struggled with mental health. Uh, now, again, I know from experience that three of us in this room can all relate to what you're saying. At least three of us in this room can relate to exactly what you're saying here. As adults, you don't see another way out. And that's the reality of it. So people saying it's selfish, like it's a choice. But as you're saying there, it's not. And especially at that age with how essentially you've been gaslighted on a number of occasions to basically have your thoughts controlled essentially like you need to think this way about this certain person and you're thinking things and your your mind essentially has not been your own there was no other you could not see another way out and that's what people don't seem to understand and i think that's the powerful thing you've, you've said there just to actually acknowledge that that it's not selfish people aren't doing it they're not in their right frame of mind because as you said why would anyone want to take their own life because there is always a choice always a choice always always anyone listen to this there's always a choice but at that moment in time you don't think there's a choice and that's what happens i mean i think i i agree with you you don't think there's a choice but then even though there's twice when i've been in that situation and again it's like you know the, the, the work that you're doing you guys are doing the work that I, i've done previously and everything like that um it's so powerful and this is why like, I'm doing this, is because it, I want it to be other people to to hear it, see it, feel it, speak to you, listen and and realise there's, there's ways to manage these. Yeah. And however, however dark and desperate you might feel before you get to that stage, because when you get to that stage, I don't think you have a choice. I didn't have a choice. It was, it was an emotional moment which I had no control over. So when people say you have a choice, and I understand what you're saying, but you have a choice up until a certain point, Agreed. and then all of a sudden, you're not in your right frame of mind, and you're and it turns off. And this is this is why, and you're completely correct. 
but this is the stage where you would essentially been sort of herded towards yeah. is you got to that cutoff point and most people don't need to get to that cutoff point because there is there's a lot there's a lot that leads up to the fact of to the point where you have no choice there's a lot there's a, so much that goes into that but as you said again let, let's take it back to to when this how, when you were that age mental health wasn't really a thing it wasn't a thing it wasn't spoken about you didn't have anyone to talk to and that's the problem this is why again what what, what i encourage what mike encourage what, what any of the guests that come on and talk about this stuff it's what we encourage just reach out so again i know they get a lot of younger people listening to this just reach out because nowadays people do understand, they do get it. There is things about that. But as you said, it gets to that certain point. And what we're trying to do and what you're trying to do by, by doing this is trying to almost be like, you don't have to get to that point. There is, there is things you can do. But as you said, once you get there, it's, yeah, it's a very dark place. I think, you know, it's like, you know, you say speak out and that, you know, I can remember, you know, at that time and even, I can't remember the first time I mentioned it, but when it's all happening... You know, people say to me, why didn't you tell your dad? Why didn't you tell your mom? Well, first of all, like, you know, my relationships with my mom and my dad, they weren't that close because of the situation. Um, telling my best friends, why would I tell my best friends? I'm thinking, like, you know, to begin with, I don't even know whether it's right or wrong. And when I do realise, why am I going to share that? And then, you know, before I know it, I'm taking an overdose. Before I know it, I'm then living or having an operation on my knee when... Um, I'm I'm being told I might not be able to to run again without a limp, so my football's gone. I'm looking out the hospital, and England schoolboys are having a trial at Stairbridge Football Ground, and I'm supposed to be there, the first Stairbridge player to be in a trials. You know, take that away from me as well. Not really sure where I'm where I'm going to live, and then my mom says, "Right, you're coming home to me and leaving my stepfather, knowing he doesn't want me, knowing what the situation is there." You know, all of these things, like you know, they they can. Um, they can get you into a into a, a certain place, and um, how do you, how do you deal with that as a as a young person? Do you know what I mean? How do you deal with it as an adult? But at least you have a choice as an adult about you know where you live and what you do and everything. But um, for me at that particular time, it was there's nowhere to go. There's there's just no there's you don't have a choice, and when you're in that position where you want to do what I did, um, it is the darkest place that for me that you can be. And, uh, yeah. It's the, and that's when you're in that situation, like I said, when you come through the other side of it, it is dark. And again, we are here now. <clears throat> and again, like, like I said, the, the universe, there's a lot of stuff, like I said, we, you, I know you believe in it as well. We've talked about it numerous times. Um, it's definitely not done with you yet. There's some of the stuff you're doing now is pretty amazing. Let's move on a bit from this as well, with the aftermath of this, because as we spoke about that, the, the abuse, then what led to um, you not wanting to be here. How else has this affected your life? Because I know that you've been struggling with depression on and off throughout your adult life. I know we've had uh, issues with relationships, um, s- sexually, any issues. I, I'm throwing these questions out here for you. I'm just going to go off on tangents with this. Um, and then the self-harm that we've, we've spoke about extensively, uh, about the alcohol, the smoking, and that horrific relationship that you had with yourself. That's, again, just a free question out there. Take it wherever you want to take it. But I'll, let's go down now into the aftermath of, of that. So let's move away from the abuse. Let's talk about the actual aftermath of this after the suicide attempts let's talk about like the actual effects and impact this actually has had on your life and go from there. I think with, um, I think with the effects of my life really, I mean like from, if you just fast forward to my football career, you know, I had 19 years as a professional footballer. I was a good pro. Um, when I was younger, I suppose like, you know, I went out with the lads after a game and stuff, but I had really the, the operations, the injuries I had, um, and that just kind of brings it home to how valuable your career is. And obviously I got married, I uh, got a beautiful daughter. And for that period of time, because like you're talking about training, you're talking about getting into the team, recovering from injuries, and all the other stuff that goes on with be- being a professional footballer, all of this stuff that's gone on and around, you don't really think about so much because like your mind is focused on the career. But then when you finish a career, and A, you're trying to 
do something else or whatever and you spend more time at home because you're not traveling then all of a sudden all the demons they come back um and then you realize you know that uh how do you cope with that now my coping mechanism when i was a a kid and um and being abused was smoking from the age of 11 nicking my fags from my dad um and playing football and i played football through a lot of pain with my knee when i was that age but then it got too much for me and then I wasn't able to do that so that was taken away from me and this is something I really want to talk about because um, I've been a pro and everybody regards me as a good pro I've also worked with kids for a very long time and um, thousands of kids as a PE teacher and my own coaching schools and everything like that and I'm there preaching you know good health and good habits and trying to give good advice and everything um, and it, it it's almost as though I've like not just cheated myself but other people as well I know I haven't to a degree because it's the way I, I cope with things but um, there's two different David Nortons there's Dave Norton who's um, who's Mr Positive and um, inspiring I think and he was like uh, happy and and a laugh and stuff and then there's a David Norton that people don't see um, the person who kind of hides himself away at times um So many years, I wouldn't say I was an alcoholic. I think they call it, um, is it a functional alcoholic? Yeah. alcoholic. Um, and don't get me wrong, I can go out and drink and have fun with people and stuff like that. And you used to have too many. The times I'm talking about, it's not having too many, but it's just having too much, if that makes sense. And um, on a daily basis. On a daily basis, um, it's also been a kind of um, what's the word? I don't know. Um, a lot of the time, I've trained or I've played football for the old boys or um, training the gym, different periods, and because of the amount of years I did as a pro, nineteen pre seasons and how many operations I had so I had rehabs all the time so my lungs my body's in a great condition not saying that you know it didn't affect me but um, I would come home from whatever I was doing it's almost as though like I was putting on a, a show as I had been putting on a mask and then coming home and and smoking 20 40 60 cigarettes and having four or five beers and a bottle of wine two bottles of wine a night and then living every day and still going and being this different person the next day um and then when i was in relationships whichever relationships they were and if that person did the drink we just did the same thing but if i was on my own even though mentally when i'm not emotionally attached to anybody i'm strong i'm really strong but then when i come home from from work it's i give a lot i give a lot so emotionally i'm drained at the end of each day because all I want to do is I want to give kids their, the attention and respect that they deserve because I didn't get it. Mm -hmm. So when I come home, it's like, you know, I go back into the zone. A, fuck you, dad. Mm -hmm. You know, fuck everybody else. This is me. Nobody can tell me what to do. Nobody can judge me because I'm on my own. I can mm -hmm. do whatever I want. And that's what I've done. We, we spoke about it, didn't we? Is that, that self-abuse, which we didn't, we can't have that conversation. That's essentially almost what it was because that's, almost what you were conditioned to think you were kind of worth I think every time I, I've had a cigarette it was like you know you're not good enough you shouldn't be doing this you can't speak with um, your, your mate is your best friend but you're not seeing him anymore you know I would say out of the cigarettes don't get me wrong it's like you know I'm not saying everyone is was 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 not in job but what I am saying most of them 
I did because like I would have a cigarette and I would have another one and another one and I would smoke to hurt myself and before you know it you you can't you you can't just switch off from it because like a it's it's not such the it's not as though it's an it is an addiction but it's not as though it's the nicotine that keeps you there it's the brainwashing of what it does you know if you look at adverts they brainwash you into thinking like cigarettes are great it's the um the brainwashing you give yourself well it relieves stress i'm gonna take a step further and this we spoke about if you remember when the, the, the trigger thing we spoke about, I think I spoke about this a bit on, on before on, on, the, on the podcasting, and me and David spoke about this. So with this sense, what we had was when you're sat there by yourself, you're taking a mask off, and a lot of people can relate to this, I think, when you've got to pretend to be okay. If you're struggling with mental health issues, you know exactly what Dave's talking about, where you've got to put on this mask and pretend to be okay for your kids, or go to work and do X, Y, and Z. But then when you take that mask off, it's exhausting. And then we've got as a trigger, and your trigger was being by yourself. And then that, that leads to thoughts and feelings. And with that, you try to escape it. So your escapism was alcohol, cigarettes, whatever it was. My mind was, was the sexual side of stuff. People use drugs, whatever it is. You're taking an action to get a reward and your reward was essentially escapism, which was to move away from the exact thing that you were feeling. Because you didn't want to feel essentially and that's what that was. So every time you were doing it, like I say, it's, it's that, that conditioning of, I don't want to feel this. Cigarettes and alcohol allow me to feel this other way. I prefer this other way. And we spoke about as well with patterns currently in your, your adult life when it comes to positive things that actually then by default try and turn negative yeah. to get a need met. Yeah. And I think a lot of people don't quite understand that. And this is when it comes to everything that's happened, which is why I want to go to childhood first with this. And again, I know you're getting professional help with this. And again, it's the whole thing, the stuff I've done with you, yeah. I'm not therapist or counselor, I've just tried to help you connect some dots with this, is the fact of you have been conditioned from a young age to have certain thought patterns and to feel certain things. And that has just sat there under the surface and it's shown up time and time again as a pattern in everything you're sort of doing. And that's what I've tried to basically highlight to you was that, well, this is what it is. Like, this is the pattern that this thing's just sat there in your subconscious. Like, consciously, you're an amazing person. Like, you're incredible. Like, everything about you, the fact of when we first met, you didn't really know me and you helped me out tremendously. You didn't need to at all. You massively helped me out, like, beyond belief. And I can't believe it was only recently that I realized it was you. I'd forgotten it was you that helped me. And that's why the whole circle that me then made to help you was so ridiculous. Like it's, the universe is insane. But that is you. That is the best version of you. That is the you that's always been there from childhood, but then been conditioned to think that you're something else. And that's where it's that, 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 that turmoil that you're being this best version of you and then you come home and you're being this other version. And that's essentially what's causing that sort of friction, that tension. And once you understand where that all came from, that's when you can do something about it, which is exactly what you've done, which is now why, again, you're still having bad days. I have bad days, everyone does, but recently, what, you back out of it, snapped out of it in a day, two days. That's the difference. And I think that's the thing that you were really realizing that it was actually just a version of self-harm again, wasn't it? Yeah, I, I, I think the, um, it's going to surprise a lot of people. And, you know, like, I've been scared. I've been scared of my own shadow. I've had this paranoia. I've had this shame, this guilt. I think one of the biggest things is, is A, you know, I know my daughter more than anybody has hated me smoking because of my health. And I would always try and say, well, I'll, I'll stop if I'm, you know, once I've got over this period or that period. And then she stopped asking me. And I, even though, like, we don't mention it, I've, like, um, you know, not said anything, but I'm racked with guilt because I'm lying to her. She may not be asking me, I'm not directly lying to but I'm lying to her, I'm lying to myself. Um, and I, every relationship that I'm in, and don't get me wrong, like, you know, there's, it's interesting really, but every relationship I've been in, I need clarity, I need honesty. And that's when it falls down. If someone says something to me, I believe them. If they say something but act differently, then that's what causes the confusion and that's what, then I become a nightmare. And I have, I have my role to play in the demise, if you like, of that relationship because of how I react. And I know that. But a lot of it comes down to the fact that I'm asking for honesty, but I can't even be honest to myself or my daughter. And that, that's, that's the thing that get, has got me. I'm, I'm on my way back now and I'm fine. And like, you know, I've got lots of things going on, but 
again, you know, if, if, you, if you're not honest with yourself and I'm not honest with my daughter, even though I'm not being dishonest because I'm not actually saying one thing to her now, in, in my heart I was being dishonest. And if you feel like that, then how can you attract honesty? Mm-hmm. You know, I look at the relationships I've been in. I know my part. I, I believe in... I believe in people at the start and I I react to whatever way our relationship's going and then when it acts out differently to what's been said I, I question it and I need clarity and then I become a nightmare because I am sensitive but the opposite to sensitive is insensitive and I'd rather be sensitive um, but at the same time the more I understand myself, I won't be getting into those situations again. Um, and the important thing is for me to look at my role and what, where I am in all of this, because I'm the common denominator. I'm, I'm the one who's been like this all my life. So do I point the finger and blame anybody else? No, I apologize if I've upset or been in that way with, with anybody, anybody I've come into contact with, but that's where it ends. I'm sorry for whatever, if I've upset people, but this is me and this is all I'm about. I think I remember you saying something like, you own what you, what your role was in your relationships or anything else. And that's what I'm trying to do as well. I know I'm a good person. I know I'm a kind person. I know I'm a loving person. I know I give. But at the same time, I know my weaknesses and where I fall down. But it's almost knowing that as well. It's like, but you've known where it's come from now. And I think this is the difference where you're at now. There was the confusion of knowing, I know how to be this version of me, but I'm not doing it. And that was the thing you were struggling with, was that knowing and doing. And that's basically what we've been speaking about. Getting, well, first, we've got to own it, which is exactly what you've been doing. Just own it, completely own it, because it's not nice to hear. We then spoke about you being the common denominator. in the, And then it's understanding about where's it come from. Do you, do you remember, um, well, it was only last week. Yeah. Um, was it two weeks ago? I think it was two weeks ago. Um, this this 12 months in, in particular, the last six months have been, everything's been thrown at me. And part of me is not the victim. I can deal with it and until I get to a certain point. And then we, we meet up, we chat about everything. We focus on certain things. I'm feeling great absolutely great and then you know uh, my academy didn't work out my, my car was away for eight weeks I had to borrow people's cars um, you know uh, I have an abscess broken relationship uh, my f- father died obviously and um, every reason there to to feel like a victim but each one that comes along you try and deal with and then all of a sudden two or three weeks ago, everything hit me again. And just was in a position where the abscess was the one because it couldn't work and it was painful. And like, uh, I'm thinking, what's next? Which, what's the way out from this? And I can remember like it was a couple of weeks ago, I came to see you and you were listening to me and you said, victim, victim mode again. And when you've got people around you, good people and positive people who are on the same wavelength, then they will give you a, a timely kick up the backside. And that's what you gave me. And I was, I, was, I was gone again for three or four days. I was like really feeling sorry for myself. Even though consciously I didn't want to be a victim, subconsciously I'd allowed myself to talk myself back into that situation. Um, and like we say, many, many times we've met each other and they've come up for certain reasons, certain timings, and that was another one for me. It was a turnaround, you know, and I've got lots going on at the moment and good things, positive things. And it's funny how they've, they've all come around the work, watching your podcast, um, Mikey's podcast, you know, and he was talking to you. Um, they all add, they all it's just another step on the ladder and to where you want to understand yourself you know that's 
<clears throat> so essentially this is well for context for that when it comes to the victim thing because again you basically saying i've had this terrible time you came and sat down and like you said i was just listening and all the words that come out of your mouth were literally just giving all your power away and you were blaming everything and everyone else and i was just like no nah. no nah. because all you were doing was just completely disempowering yourself which you had been your entire life and basically we had this conversation if you remember one of the first conversations we had i said it to you blunt I was just like, you need to take your power back. And I say this all the time. I talk about it a lot. And this is a perfect example of this. Stuff that happens to you is not fair. You don't deserve it. There's nothing you could have done about it. And you have every single right to sit and allow your life to fester on these things. But as you can attest to, it doesn't get you anywhere. Because all you're doing is giving that scumbag power. When you realize, now fuck that. That I'm taking my power back and you take responsibility, you get out of that victim mode, what can I actually do to move forward with this? And that's what we then spoke about. And then Snapchat in three days. And all you're doing by doing these things is moving yourself to a different path. So you've got to think, you've been walking down that same path for however many years. And now what you're trying to do is you're trying to walk on a different path. And sometimes it gets scary on that path. And it's then easier to go back to the other path because you know it and it's well lit. And you've put all the fairy lights, but then all you need is someone to be like, mate, no, 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 this isn't the path for you anymore. This is the path you need to walk down. And it's got someone there just to guide you. It's your journey. If you've got some amazing people around you supporting you, just guide you down that path. And that's all it is. And that's the difference between going off the rails for three months and three days. And each time it happens, because life's not done with you. It, life always throws stuff at us. But each time, what you're doing now is you're taking back your power. And this one I talk about it all the time on the podcast. This is what it actually looks like. It's just you just taking back that power and being like, right, I can't do anything about any of this stuff. What I can do is choose what I'm going to do right now, where I put my energy, where I put my focus, and all you've done is just put it on you and just becoming this better version of you, becoming that person that you know is in there. And look at all the amazing stuff that's happened to your life recently. And it's no coincidence that you've become this better version of you. You've been putting this good energy out there and the universe is like, there you go, mate. This is what we want to see. And it's then rewarding you. It's no coincidence. Honestly, the journey you're going on and the stuff that you've done and this podcast today has been absolutely incredible. I want to wrap this up by asking you a question. What advice would you give to someone that has been in the situation you've been in, either as a child or an adult, that doesn't know what to do, they don't know who to talk to, or if they should talk to anyone? What advice would you go back and give yourself or this person? It's a really difficult one because if I take myself back to that age, I, w I still wouldn't, I, I think, not talk to anybody. Um, for many reasons, but what I will say is, if I was able to have spoken to somebody and that person would have believed me. Remember back then, who would believe you? Yeah. Whereas now there are lots and lots of different places, uh, people, groups or whatever that you can speak to. And um, if it's someone outside of the family, speak to your mum, speak to your dad, whichever one you're closest to. If you can't speak to your brother or sister um, and let them speak to mum or dad about it. Um, but the one bit of advice I, I would really emphasize is that don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of, of telling somebody because you won't be judged. You can't be judged if we're talking about children in particular, because forever in a day, I felt shame and guilt and that shame and guilt has, has spread into everything. So you, 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 sh you feel shame and guilt about the actual abuse, but then you feel shame and guilt about everything else you do because you're being judged. You feel ashamed. Why am I being ashamed? I don't even know what I'm being ashamed for. Don't be just, just, you're not going to be judged. Just feel as though you can talk to somebody. And I would say someone that you're close to in the family, if not a close friend, but you know, explain to them that you don't know who to talk to and let them talk to somebody if you don't feel as though you can. Um, 
or if there's a school teacher um, or a head that you you know. I, I know people, if I'm working at school, I can feel the energy with a teacher or I don't feel the energy, so I'm not going to go this way. But I'm able to go there because I know I can trust them. Mm-hmm. Um, but don't bottle it up for 40 years, like 30 years that I did and so many others. I mean, how many of the footballers who were abused have kept it to themselves and were only able to come out because of Andy Woodward and Tony Bryan and people like that, all the other guys. Paul Stewart, I played for England Youth with Paul Stewart and he was abused. We were both playing at the same age for England Youth and we'd both been abused. None of us knew, any, either of us knew any different. Don't bottle it up, talk to somebody. And more than anything, I'd say, like, and this is why, um, again, like, I know you're sitting in front of me, but what I've learned from you, I think it's important to be able to get this out to as many people as possible and expose it to, to everybody so they can see exactly how they can deal with this on a real personal level. Because like I say, I've had lots of counselling and lots of help from great people. Um, but in an hour and a half or however long it was, you've given me that information where I've learned more about myself and how to understand it all. Um, so I think like, you know, this is what needs to get out. You've given me this opportunity. I've always wanted to say something, but I've been scared to death or I've not wanted to say anything because of the fear. Um, but I felt really comfortable. You know, I like what, what you've got, the energy you've got, you know, and all of you, you know, it's, we're all, we're all heading in the, the, the same direction. And if one person's going to learn from it, me today, then hopefully someone else will as well. And the thing is like, you know, that, and again, how many people are suffering right now? We're talking about this and we're talking about what would you say to to people who are going through this. If you sit down and you think, really, how many people, young people who are actually suffering abuse right now, you'd be in tears. Mm-hmm. Because we can't do anything about that. And this is the same with me. When I was being abused, nobody knows about it. Nobody knows about it. Nobody can take that feeling of... Um, that feeling in your heart that how do I get out of this you know and it needs to people need kids need to be in a position where they can we we can give them people more people to talk to Mm -hmm. that they can trust Mm -hmm. but then they've got to find people like you Mm -hmm. and you guys who can who can accept that because what's the biggest problem like with kids who get abused for me trust how do you trust anybody ever again yeah and that's my biggest problem. I trust people to start with because that's what I am. But then if that trust is broken in even in the littlest way, I don't trust. You hurt me once, you, you broke that trust. And I can't get over it. I, f- I find it really difficult to, to get over stuff until it's clear, until it's explained to me. Mm. So we need those kids to be able to trust people. And, you know, because why would you trust anybody? And the person who's like abused you and betrayed you has had to be a person who's shown you so much care in the first place. Yep. So why would you trust anybody else? Mm-hmm. Uh, honestly, this has been one of the most powerful episodes I've ever done, and it would be. I want to say a massive thank you to you, and I just want to say how amazing you've done here. Um, when we had that little break, everyone said the same thing. And I also want to give a shout out to my audience here as well, because the reason why Dave felt so comfortable opening up and talking is because he's watched the episodes and because he saw the stuff I was posting. And the reason why I was doing that stuff is because you guys share the show. And as Dave says there, we're trying to get this information out there. So again, just do what you guys always do. If you take any value from the episode, or if you know anyone that will, just share the show, get the information out there. Like Dave said, we're trying to help people here. Dave's done this for himself to get it off his chest, to give himself that peace. But he's also done it for you guys as he said, don't live in fear. Like, learn from what everything, everything Dave said here. Learn from it. Take it into your own lives and apply it. Where can people find out more information about you and what you're doing right now on Instagram? Uh, yeah, on, on Instagram. I'm, I'm actually, um, I'm 57 years of age, very fit 57 years of age, or most of the time. 
I'm actually fighting on the 22nd of October in Derby. White collar boxing. It's a big fear of mine stepping into a ring. Physical fear. But at the same time, it's symbolically facing my fears of everything we've just spoken about. Um, if I come through that, then I'm open to fight Paul Devlin, ex um, Birmingham, Notts County, um, to promote mental and emotional um, well-being, which will include obviously child abuse and also hopefully you guys will agree to get heavily involved in it so we can really push the, the name because hopefully, like, because it's an ex Villa and ex Birmingham player coming together in the ring, um, will create a lot of publicity and awareness of what you're doing. Because I know you've just said it, like, I've watched the podcast and everything. I've listened and, like, you've told me stuff that I already know, but you've told me a massive amount that I don't, and that's given me an understanding. So, honestly, no, thank you. Thank you. Um, and again, we'll, uh, we'll speak soon.